Welcome, everybody, to this policy exchange event titled, What is Labour's Agenda for the Red Wall? As everybody knows, the, the Red Wall story was one of the biggest stories of the last election. Depending on your definition of a Red Wall seat, about 25 to 30 traditional Labour seats fell to the Tories, uh, which made a big contribution to, to their overall majority. But it kind of it revealed uh, a, an underlying pattern in British politics that has been clear for, for um, a decade, perhaps even a couple of decades, uh, with some of the traditional Labour areas uh, losing their attachment to a, a modern Labour Party that has become much more focused on liberal metropolitan, liberal graduate issues. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people in the Midlands in the North felt that the party had, um, had moved away from them, not so much on socioeconomic issues, but more, more on, on socio-cultural ones. Um, um, but now Labour has a new leader. Um, the Tories have, have had a difficult few months of it, to, to, to put it mildly. Um, there is the possibility that these seats could quite quickly switch back and we're going to talk about that this afternoon um, and see whether one of the one of the kind of adages of British politics in in the last few years has been that it's easier for the right to move to the left on economics than it is for the left to move to the right on culture and I think that is might be one interesting way of framing some of this discussion anyway we've got um, three very interesting people to talk about this uh, we have um, Caroline Flint, um, who ironically was one of the people who was warning the Labour Party about the precisely uh, this, uh, the, these political issues for many years and then lost her seat in Don Valley in 2019, was one of the red, uh, red wall seats to fall. Um, we have Caroline here. We also have Deborah Mattinson, who is the uh, founder of the consultancy Britain Thinks, but also uh, most relevant for this afternoon is the author of the, the, the book on the red, whole Red Wall question, Beyond the Red Wall, um, a must read for anyone who, uh, who, who wants to speak sensibly on these issues. We also have here um, in the studio in London, we have Sebastian Payne, who is the Whitehall correspondent of the Financial Times. Uh, so what's gonna happen is that we are, each of the, the three guests are gonna speak for about five minutes on the issue, and I think they will then have a conversation, or all four of us will have a conversation amongst ourselves, and then there, there will be time for some questions and comments from, from you people out there. Um, so um, let's have Deborah, as I said, has just, just uh, published this book. Um, who is it published by, Deborah? Bite Back. By Bite, Bite Back. Back. It's by Bite Back Publishing, um, called Beyond the Red Wall. Um, so let's have Deborah first. Then we'll come to Sebastian and then to Caroline. So, Deborah, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, David. So, um, I took the brief to be to talk about what Labour needed to do to win, win back the Red Wall, but I think it's quite hard to address that without spending a moment or two thinking about why Labour lost in the first place. So, I just, if I may, will spend a few minutes outlining what I think, or a few seconds. I haven't got very long. Outlining why I think. Labour lost, and then I'll talk about some things I think Labour needs to do to win back. So, so five reasons, basically. The first is a pattern of very long-term neglect. So these places, and by the way, I count, I think it's more than 25 to 30, I think 45. I think it depends whether you include the Northeast or not. I reckon it's about four and a half million people. Um, and those places, all of which have a very proud industrial past, have been neglected for a long time. Um, in a recent poll, we asked people whether or not they felt their area got uh, more or less investment than other places in the rest of the country. Um, the an answering less investment, 69% people who lived in Yorkshire, 65% people who lived in the Northwest, 64% people who lived in the Northeast, and only 30% of Londoners. So there is something about long term economic neglect. There's something about Labour focusing on the wrong issues. Um, and I had loads of evidence of this, which I've put down in the book, but, you know, focusing, stressing about countries they don't know about or care about, people they feel are less deserving than them, 
um, and a whole host of grievances really that are about Labour not, not, not thinking about the things they're thinking about. Not being trusted to run the economy is also a very important one. This is a long-standing issue for Labour. When I first started advising Labour in the run-up to the 87 election a long, long time ago, it was one of the biggest problems. Bob, who was a builder, um, Bob the Builder in Darlington said, you know, they slosh your money around, don't they? There's a sense of Labour being different people nowadays. And this very much touches on the topic, I think, in David's new book. Um, basically, Labour is snooty London graduates who look down on people like them who work with their hands and they look down on the things they care about, too. Um, so Labour had gone from being the party that was a pie and a pint to the party that was about quinoa um, and Brexit uh, was at the heart of that debate. And then finally, poor leadership. Um, and that's at Corbyn. But I think it's really, really worth stressing that while everybody I met, without exception, loathed Corbyn, um, it didn't, it, it, it ended with him, but it didn't start with him. It's been going on for very much longer than that. So very briefly, five things that Labour, I think, can do to win. And I'm happy to pick up on more detail. First is those red wallers must be wooed. They've been neglected for so long. They are now very unforgiving. And, uh, you know, a few tokens won't work. They must be wooed. Um, one person said, you could draw a line across the middle of Britain. The bottom half is the haves. The top half is the have-nots. And Labour has somehow ended up on the wrong side. Labour's aspirations need to more closely reflect those in the red walls. So Labour's no longer the champion of the working class, thought to embrace a different and often kind of whimsical set of priorities. And now with the new leadership, people don't know quite what Labour stands for at all. Um, and Karen from Stoke said, I do think their values are our values, but we're not talking about a little tweak here. They need to completely reinvent themselves. Part of that reinvention, this is the third thing, is that Labour needs to articulate its own brand of patriotism. My conclusion, one of my many conclusions, was that if you don't love your country, the Red Wall will never, ever love you. Um, Ian, a plumber from Accrington, Accrington, said to me, they have to show us the Britain that they want to see and the Britain that they believe in. Labour also, back to the economic point, one of the main reasons why Labour lost, this has to be addressed if Labour wants to win. Labour has to apply discipline as it develops its offer. It has to prove that it won't waste those voters' hard-earned cash, and it is hard-earned. Everybody I met worked incredibly hard. And while red wall wallers tend towards economic liberalism and austerity is well and truly over, it'll be really important to reassure voters like, uh, like Bob, my handyman from Darlington, that they won't slosh the money around. And last, but very definitely not least, um, I think one of the things that people felt was that Labour had a kind of rather hand-wringing approach to people like them whenever it did focus on them, which it didn't very often, but when it did, it was wringing its hands at their poor lives. Um, Labour can only succeed by offering an optim optimistic vision. Their biggest worry was the future for their children. They thought, not unreasonably, quite frankly, why should their children have to leave home to have a decent future and a decent life and a decent job? Um, a lot of Red Wallers had a real spring in their step after the 2019 election. And all, on this, is, along with many, many other things, there's a huge amount of ground for Labour to make up. The advice from the Red Wallers was really clear, and I'll end with this. One person said to me, Boris gave us a bit of hope. We just need to be given a bit of hope up here. We need to feel positive about our future. I'll end there. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Sebastian, your go. Thanks, David. I'll just move over here. Well, thank you very much. And I feel like um, everything that Deborah said there, I'd absolutely 100% agree with in terms of what Labour needs to do. But just to add my own perspective on this, and I should do a bit of a plug as well if I can, that I am also writing a book on what's happened to Labour in its traditional heartlands called Broken Heartlands, which will be out next year. And I'm planning to spend a good couple of months in 10 key places to try and tell the story here. But I did do a lot of travel during the 2019 election around the Red Wall and saw some of these key themes here. I think the first thing we have to look at is what exactly happened in 2019, because that was an election very much of 
that, that particular time there, that there was a certain set of circumstances that won't be repeated again that gave Boris Johnson such a big majority. The first thing, of course, is Brexit. The fact that this was an election about do we want to leave the EU or not, and that message that Mr Johnson have of getting Brexit done was very popular and very potent, including with Remainers as well, people who just felt totally fed up with the whole debate and just wanted to get it over with. That will have gone by the next and future elections. Elections. The second thing, as Deborah just talked about there, was Jeremy Corbyn. It is hard to understate how universally unpopular he was in those traditional Labour seats in the north of England and in the Midlands. You could not find a character that turned off those voters as much. And again, he has gone. He will not be standing for the Labour Party. And of course, we'll come on to Keir Starmer is trying to do everything possible to say the party is under new management, under new leadership, as we've seen for the party's conference slogan this year. So you put those two things together and it's easy to see how those seats fell. But as we know, there are much longer historical trends that gave us the collapse of the Red Wall. And I think the key question that the Tories are trying to get their head around and Labour is trying to get their head around is how much of that 2019 election result was those two factors of Brexit and Mr. To Corbyn and how much was the longer trends of deindustrialization, the cultural divide that has gone up, and this sense that those voters felt they simply weren't being listened to. Now, crucially, Boris Johnson realizes this. The first thing he said after the 2019 election to people was, we have to earn the trust of these voters. He knew that all the people in the Red Wall voted Conservative on a wing and a prayer, and he wants to spend the next five years trying to prove the Conservative Party is on their side. And that point that Deborah made about people saying, well, they just want to be heard, they want to be respected, Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda is all about trying to do that. Of course, the slight problem he's got is coronavirus, which has come along that sort of knocked the whole agenda of this government off course. And there is a big question about when they can really get back to that, because coronavirus is going to dominate this year, next year, and it's going to be 2022 before anything resembling normal politics comes back again. So when do you get back to that point? Is there enough time and, most importantly, money to be able to try and speak to those voters and prove to them that the Conservatives can deliver for them. Delivering for those Red Wall voters is going to be a challenge for the Tories because to do that, essentially, the party needs to move the left on economic issues and the right on social issues. And David, you said in your introduction at the beginning, it's easier for right-wing parties to do that than left-wing parties, which I think is true. But doing that is going to create a challenge for the Tory coalition. I think you're beginning to see that in the discussions for the budget that's coming later this year, which will be a key indication about how serious the Tories are about winning back the Red Wall. Because in the budget later this year, if you were doing a budget for the traditional Tory coalition, you would cut public services, raise taxes on things like fuel duty that the uh, traditional Tory voters in the South East and London can do. That can't be easily done in the Red Wall. And I was in Stoke very recently and spoke to a whole bunch of people there. And they are petrified of tax rises on those kind of things. And this, again, shows the dilemma the Tories have got. They've got a voting coalition that, in some ways, isn't too disrepresentative of the one Labour used to have, where you've got a certain set of voters that have an economic and cultural set, and another set who have the opposite half. And it's Boris Johnson's challenge to try and bridge those two sort of things. Now, to Keir Starmer and his challenge here, I think he's done absolutely everything right so far to try and win back the Red Wall. He's trying to create a clear red line between the era of Corbynism. You know, he's been so blatantly obvious the party is under new leadership and is doing things very differently. He's being out and out patriotic, talking about the armed forces, talking about getting Brexit done. Now, all that might do very well, but there's still a big question of, is that going to be enough? And how much the memory of Jeremy Corbyn will still play as a big factor come 2024? But I think I'll just give you a quick anecdote from my most recent trip to the Red Wall, which was in Dudley. Again, Dudley North, a seat that's gradually been falling away from the Labour Party for some time. And I spent a couple of days there speaking to voters and thinking, you know, we've had this big crisis over coronavirus. The government has struggled. What are people thinking about the government? Well, the fact is nearly 
everybody I met there said, well, it's a pandemic. They're trying their best. They're doing their best in their circumstances. What do you think about Keir Starmer? They said, oh, no idea who he is. <laughs> the only one person I could find there said, oh, isn't he that guy who backed Remain? And if that's the only perception people in the Red Wall are going to have of Labour and Keir, they've got a big mountain to climb. So my view on what Labour is doing is the right stuff. I think the question for Boris Johnson is, can he go far enough and do enough given coronavirus? And then the real question, which I'd love to hear what the panel thinks about this, is come the next election, what's it going to be fought on? If it's on administrative competence, then Boris Johnson has a problem. If it's on cultural values, then I think he still has a chance. And if it's a mix of the two, then I think there's a whole bunch of the Red Wall seats that have become classic marginal seats that will fall back. But I think there's others that very much will stay in the Tory grass because of these longer term trends of deindustrialization, of the changing makeup of these seats. Because you take seats like North West Durham, for example, had that been in Kent, it would have been a Tory safe seat for 20 years. So it really, for me, comes down to this cultural question about who is speaking to the those people and do those voters think that the Tories are now the people who represent them or not? Mm. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, Caroline? Um, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to all these visits for people writing books about the Red Wall. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many uh, make their way to Doncaster and Don Valley. Um, look, um, first of all, about where Labour is at the moment, um, I think without doubt, you know, the change of leader has been good for Labour so far. Um, you know, without being personal about it, when you look at Jeremy Corbyn's approval ratings compared to Keir's, um, actually, you know, it is a is a is a sort of sea change in perception of the of the Labour leader, and we might go into that more later on. So I think Keir has made a good start. He has focused on the here and now. Uh, to be honest, the pandemic in some ways has been first and foremost, as it should be in terms of public attention, but it put Brexit on the back burner. Uh, we, if without the pandemic, we could have had lots more discussions, which the Tories would have liked, to uh, attack here, attack the Labour Party over their position pre the 2019 general election. That clearly hasn't come to pass. And in approaching the coronavirus crisis, uh, Keir has chosen the battles he wants to fight, where he has challenged the government, but also has, to the criticism of some on the left in the Labour Party, uh, chose to be uh, constructive and, uh, and considerate to work together for the wider good, the public good of keeping people healthy uh, and safe. Um, so I think that's been important. He's also suggested, um, actually in recent days, it's a, the, the pandemic uh, has changed everything. I mean, it's changed everything about talking about how we live, how we work, what the economy is going to look like in the future. And that in as itself, as Keir has indicated interviews this week, uh, has allowed him to say, look, you know, whatever I went into the leadership election talking about in terms of policies, it's all going to have to be mindful of these changes that are affecting us all um, in terms of the recession we're in and whether you know, jobs will come back and in what form they will come back in the future. Um, and again, he's had some criticism about that, but it's completely sensible to say that. We cannot be stuck in a mindset that is not mindful of what is really happening in the real world for people, whether they live in cities or towns or rural communities as opposed to urban. The branding of a new leadership can be clearly taken in two ways. It's a, a new leadership for the Labour Party, but also a new leadership for the country. And again, that is playing into, leaning into public concerns, which are evident now, about the handling of the pandemic, uh, competence being up there as it's always been in terms of how I think most of the public, wherever you come from, uh, judges, politicians and uh, governments. Um, and again, I think laying the ground, not in detail now, but for Keir Starmer to look at what, what uh, distance there can be between Boris Johnson's approach and his approach. His approach. Having said that, uh, Keir and the Labour Party should not underestimate Boris Johnson uh, and the traps he will set for Labour. That was a mistake last year. That was a mistake last year when they said he couldn't get a deal, uh, there wouldn't be an election and, and so on. And all of that was completely wrong. And we have at least 
well, at the most, maybe three years, because I'm not sure the five-year parliament term will last, <laughs> to be honest, uh, but maybe four years at most. And that not only gives time for Keir and Labour, but it also gives time for Boris Johnson and the Conservatives to judge where they are coming out of the crisis and how they want to frame the debate for a next uh, general election. Um, in terms of winning back the Red Wall, uh, it is enormous. And as um, Deborah's indicated, it's not just about the seats that we lost in December of last year. It's about uh, many of those small towns that we lost in 2010 as well, uh, some of which have got pretty massive majorities now. And even if you look even earlier than that, you look at Mansfield, which we lost in 2017. I, uh, I think, you know, uh, the Conservative MP that had doubled his majority by the time we came to 2019. So it's a mountain to climb and, and we're still in, in the foothills. Um, there's no need to rush out a full policy programme, but I think there are steps that do need to be taken by Labour to understand the important lessons from this red uh, wall collapse. It's not just recently, um, it's been going on for a while. I think back in 2009, David, uh, 10, I started talking about some of the problems because I was watching very closely how UKIP, before the Brexit party, was eking its way into the Labour vote, into our communities, not just in national elections, but local elections as well. And of course, you know, one of the things Gordon Brown is still remembered, uh, uh, remembered for is his exchange with Mrs Duffy over immigration. And it's incredible how even now, um, I think it was in uh, the Lord Ashcroft report earlier this year, and I'm sure Deborah's picked it up too, and, and other pollsters and other people interested in it, that that's one of the things as a memory that spontaneously comes back from people who also have concerns about uh, immigration and, and identity in their, uh, their communities. That exchange with Mrs Duffy, uh, where he was heard off camera saying she was a bigot. It's incredible how I think the Westminster bubble completely gets it wrong of what they think is actually being heard in the wider public uh, and how things are received. And that's why the doorstep is so important in all this, because I tell you what, you get you do get it straight from people on the doorstep. The Tories won more working class votes than Labour in the last general election. And in fact, I think under Theresa May, uh, the Tories won more working class votes than they'd ever done before under her as well, even though that was a disappointing election. We know that in every social economic group, uh, the Tories outperform Labour uh, in that last election. Uh, that's why we not only lost 54 seats that are defined as the Red Wall seats, 24 of which we have never lost before, including my own. But John Trickett in Hemsworth now has a majority of 1,180, not 10,000. Ed Miliband's majority is 2,400 from 14,000. And the Tories, as I said, have healthy majorities in many small towns, uh, including from 2010. The Watfords, the Swindon South, which actually beyond the Red Wall, and we haven't even got into Scotland, <laughs> beyond the Red Wall, for a Labour majority, they need to win those two. So if Labour is listening, first is off is it cannot look down on Labour's lost voters. Uh, I already see on social media, and, and any time I comment on this issue, a, let's be honest, a healthy do dose or maybe unhealthy dose of denial from many Labour members about why we lost the Red Wall seats uh, and the impact of both Jeremy, but also Labour's position on Brexit and the underlying concerns about the values behind a people's vote that didn't chime with those people in those Red Wall seats. There is still huge denial, denial out there of what has happened. I will be told that as I am, you know, um, not as left-wing as some, that it's my fault because I'm not as left-wing. But Dennis Skinner lost his seat mm. uh, in 2019, so I think that's a bit hard uh, and harsh to judge me on. But it cannot look down, and what it cannot do is um, basically just say, we, you know, you were wrong, let us prove that you were wrong and we are right. They have to show that Labour has changed. And to give permission for those voters to vote Labour again, that has to be acknowledged loudly and clearly that something has gone wrong. It is not their fault. It is the Labour Party's fault as to why those votes were lost. And again, they need to remember, it would be comforting to think with everything going on and, uh, um, you know, 
mistakes being made by the Conservative government and other things, and having good policies, that that will be enough. But, you know, once you break the ma magic of a family who, for generations, have voted for a particular party, and this works for the Conservatives and for Labour, it worked for Labour in 97, but it has now happened, happened for the Tories in a big way, that somehow you will wave, wave a magic wand and those voters can come back. The spell has been broken, just as it's been broken in Scotland. And the par there are parallels there. Um, whilst there are different issues, there are parallels with what's happened to Labour in Scotland too. Mm. So we have to do something else. First of all, we have to understand the priorities of working class support. The next election won't be fought on Brexit, but I would suggest that the battleground will include the values that underpinned the Brexit debate and those people who voted for it. Mm -hmm. It is unlikely to be about Labour investment versus Tory austerity because the Tories are spending record amounts uh, to lift us out of this pandemic and undoubtedly that will be something they will be thinking about going forward. Yes, Labour will champion the NHS, but the Tories will spend record sums on the NHS in the coming years. And I think one of the things I've often thought, and I think I again spoke about this some years ago, about Labour's tendency to go, you know, it was, you know, their view is that everything's going to end, it's the apocalypse, everything's going to fail. We often use that on the NHS. And we've used that in countless elections in 2010, in 2015, mm. in 2017 and 2019. And whilst the NHS is a strong issue for Labour, it is not enough to rely on that to uh, win an election. So I think, you know, I would suggest that in some respects that Labour should think about um, stopping always asserting that the debate is about the Tories selling off the NHS to Tesco, Virgin or some US company. Um, and maybe, because I don't think they will, but maybe they should focus on the real debate on staffing, on training, on social care, which I think on every day, those are the issues that most people worry about in the NHS. They have to think about jobs. Of course they do. But there's a danger with these communities that they want to win back. But the sort of jobs they're talking about don't really match. It's a bit like when Labour used to just talk about the knowledge economy. If you're working in a community where most of the jobs are low skill, low paid, and all you ever hear is a party talking about jobs that require degrees. Why would you not feel left out from that debate? And whilst we do need to talk about infrastructure and the low carbon economy and the jobs that come with it, it's about that we also have to speak to the jobs that are in people's communities today. And in the red wall communities, you know, overwhelmingly small businesses, apart from the... Mm. Oops. ...and employment. Uh, halting the collapse of small businesses, keeping towns thriving. These are re the real present issues that worry people about what's changing in their communities. Crime and community are vital. There was a reason for Labour's success, you know, in the uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s. Our relentless focus on antisocial behaviour and crime is a really important factor for poor communities because they're often the communities that suffer most from And it really, really worked as something you could point to that was changing by that relentless approach on those issues at that time. Patriotism, it's important, but again, it's not gonna be enough to just put patriotism in every speech. It's not just about waving the Union Jack. Um, it's not even about you know what you wear at the Cenotaph. That's important, but it's bigger than that. It is about people feeling that the Labour Party wants better things for the country, but it's proud of the country we've got as well. Um, and also, I think a lot of the voters felt that any suggestion that the UK should control its borders was somehow racist, and therefore, as a country, we were a horrible country. Uh, most countries have rules about their borders, uh, and in doing so, to take this stance, particularly under Jeremy Corbyn, just conceded too much ground to the right. Fair migration is not anti-socialist. Mm. Labour's patriotism has to be about more than believing that no one should be in homelessness or poverty. It's about being optimistic for Britain after Brexit, proud of our history, confident about our country as a force for good. And I think if they can think along those lines, which is a hard ask because they've got to persuade some of the party membership to think along those lines, and that's going to be tricky. Mm. So we share values and we can rebuild the Red Wall. Thank you, Caroline. Um, can, can I just... Um, can I just suggest briefly to all three of you that we, we look at it almost from the other point of view and 
suggest that there is actually a logic in abandoning the red wall voters, uh, that Labour's soul is now irrevocably distant from the patriotic, small c conservative working class voter. Labour is the party of those people who leave to achieve, as, as Deborah was saying. Um, why not just give up on the red wall? Um, uh, you know, a lot of the trends uh, we're, we're continuing to have, uh, I don't think it's necessarily good for the country, but we're continuing to have an expansion of higher education. 40% of jobs in the economy are now graduate only, so there's a huge incentive still for people to, to go to college. Uh, they go to college and they tend to come out with more liberal metropolitan values. Labour will, you know, in, you know, in the fullness of time, scoop up all those voters and they will be sufficient, really, to replace the red wall voters. And, I mean, the, the alternative, I mean, as Caroline was sort of, you know, suggesting with an ironic smile, the alternative to that is changing the activist base, the MP base of the party, because the electorate can smell it if you don't believe it. You know, if you're spouting sort of faux patriotism. I mean, I mean Ed Miliband did this a bit. I mean, he kind of knew what the problem was. It's just that he was irrevocably a kind of North London liberal, and he couldn't really do it. And people could see that. Um, you know, it's no good just, to, you know, you can't just appoint Claire Ainsley and assume sort of job done. You've got to replace <laughs> an entire activist base, an MP base, and it's not going to happen. So why not go with the modern trends that are actually working in favour of Labour as a metropolitan liberal graduate party and give up on the Red Wall? Mm. Uh, Coming to me first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Deborah, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you are absolutely right that there, you know, there's a lot of soul searching to be done and there's a very difficult coalition to be forged. Um, I, I think that if you... If, if Labour were to go that route, quite apart from whether or not it, it could do so without having a you know a kind of existentialist nervous breakdown, um, it actually the numbers aren't there. There aren't enough people. I mean, both part. This is true for both parties, by the way, as well. I mean, Seb alluded to this, I think, in in, in his opening remarks. I think that um, it's very difficult for the Tories as well. You know, the red wall in itself is is not a shoe in for either party. And that bring together that coalition in, you know, we have a very divided country. We have a group of people, you know, on the one hand who believe one set of things, on the other hand who believe another set of things. One lot feel very resentful, the other lot feel a little bit guilty. Um, it's a challenge and it's going, to be, it's going to be about uniting that coalition, whoever wins. Um, is Labour worse placed to do that than the Tories? No, I don't think so. I think it's difficult for both of them. Mm -hmm. Can, can, uh, can I, but before asking Sebastian and perhaps Caroline to come back on this one, can I just remind people out there that um, you can pose questions and, and indeed make comments, but you have to uh, raise your hand on Zoom if, if you <laughs> get what I mean. Um, uh, anyway, so do um, if, if, if you want to make a make a comment or, or, or pose a question, do do so. Uh, Sebastian, on this question of should Labour just abandon the Red Wall? It's a really interesting idea, David, because if you look at where the temperament of people like Keir Starmer is, the trade unions, the activist base, that would be the natural place you're going. But what you're suggesting is betting on an electoral coalition that doesn't exist and may never exist. And I guess that's what Deborah was saying. And in some ways, what Hillary Clinton tried to do in America in 2016 was to talk about an America that doesn't exist that could vote for her. Uh, and it didn't transpire in 2016. Maybe it will transpire by one day. I think the issue is that Labour's always had this bridge, which is the Humberside, the Humberside to Hampstead alliance, which has been, I guess, the metropolitan liberals and the old working class. And Brexit has totally eroded that bridge now. Now, maybe you can build a new bridge to something else. And of course, I think, as, as someone else alluded to, we've got the question of Scotland as well in all this as well. And some of the characteristics you need to appeal to the Red Wall, you need to appeal to Scotland. And there's no conceivable way Labour can form a majority government without at least winning back some seats of Scotland. So there is an argument to say, yes, they should just forget it and focus on a very different kind of electorate, but it would be to consign Labour to permanent opposition if they did that. Would it? I mean, t Tim Bale pointed out in, uh, in a piece on Unheard. I read that today, piece today, yeah. Um, that actually one of the things working in Labour's favour, perhaps pursuing the kind of broad strategy that I was suggesting, is that Labour and the Lib Dems are no longer in opposition. I mean, the, the, they have a kind of 
they have a free run, at, 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 as it were. They're, they're not. Mm. They're not competing. They have. They have a kind of. They have a kind of non-compete arrangement now, sort of out there naturally, as it were. So that, that. So that they could. You know, some kind of Labour Lib Dem coalition government in the in the foreseeable future might be possible. I think it's really interesting because Ed Davey has obviously just become leader of the Liberal Democrats and he's clearly trying to take them into a similar space to where Keir Starmer is and you could say they're going to be competing for the same voter base. I think the seats that are going to be most fascinating at the next election are, yes, the Red War, do they stay Tory or do they flip back to Labour, but it's seats like Isha and Walton um, in Surrey which used to be you know, as safe as houses Tory whereas the last election it was one of the most marginal seats. Swindon South, another example that's a seat that is outside the metropolitan reach of London but is now much more marginal and it's those kind of places that the sort of more left-wing economic -y stuff the Tory is going to have to do for the Red War will be less popular so in some ways it feels to me as if there is an opening in British politics for a sort of FDP style the German free market liberal party that is kind of I guess where the Tory party was under David Cameron and George Osborne mm -hmm. but there again the Tories are ruthlessly pragmatic and I think it is possible they can speak to both sides of that. And um, Keir Starmer is clearly, clearly reaching in one direction, which is the Red Wall. We'll see how that goes down in places like Isha and like Swindon. Mm. Okay, Caroline, do you want to come in on this one? Well, I think if, uh, and I don't think Keir Starmer will do this, uh, but the idea that um, Labour should abandon the Red Wall seats, well, what, there's no, what's the point of the Labour Party? You know, we've got the Liberal Party for that, uh, so we might as well just you know, just go into that. So I don't think it will happen. It is tricky. Um, you know, there is no doubt about it that um, the, uh, the Labour Party is able to stack up votes in cities and university towns, and that's been particularly ongoing, again, not just in the last four years, but if you look at the majorities in London in 1997, in some of the marginal target seats we had to win, and look at their majorities today, they are two, three times what they were in 97. That is a set, that is what's going on in the demographics in London. It's become more diverse. There's fewer white working class people there. And you've got this, you know, you know, this um, uh, group of young people, graduates and better off people, liberals, as well as the ethnic diversity of London that has just helped Labour, not just in inner London, but outer London as well, to uh, become a Labour city. And likewise in university towns too. So how do you do this? I think part of it has to be about um, being able to have a more, I think, you know, proper debate about values and what it means. You know, I think most people across society do think, believe we should have a fair system, a system based on rules. They do believe that actually it's important to protect people from crime uh, and the effects of crime. Um, and they do believe in, you know, being proud of the country. And I think, you know, there's many people in cities that believe that as well as in university towns but also particularly in our, our small towns, but also for our smaller places outside of those areas. We, mm. We've got to have, a, not, when we talk about, you know, building the country, there's been so much focus on our cities, city regions, city renaissance, that in all of that, we've actually lost sight of some of the, what might seem rather smaller changes in per public services or support that really mean something to a community in say Doncaster as elsewhere. You know, you know, I could walk down Victoria High Street to the House of Commons and pass about six or seven banks from Victoria Station to the Houses of Parliament. I can walk through a whole town in Don Valley and there isn't a single bank that is there. You know, these are the things that, you know, really worry people about what is happening uh, to their communities. And these are easy decisions, uh, easy discussions, but they have to uh, be had. And I, and I just think in this area, um, Labour needs to sort of really think about what it is saying to people and what its offer is. And we need to have some flexibility room for different offers that allows people to hear a political party and say, yeah, you know, that city needs this, but there's something for us here as well. Uh, and for too long, that hasn't been heard. That hasn't been heard in the general, I think, debate of what's important in our economy and socially for the country. OK, uh, we've got a question. Um, well probably a question and comment from heavyweight political commentator John McTernan, mm -hmm. none other than. Um, John, are you out there? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, hi. So um, I think there's a bit too much pessimism, really, in that Labour offered somebody as leader who should have been in the Communist Party, who hate, who loved Russia, hated the country, um, and stood against almost everything Labour has stood has stood for in its 100 years worth of existence. Um, it's not surprising Labour lost a lot of seats, and I think you can you can you 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 can you can get over pessimistic about this. I mean, I I take this question about whether red wall seats were neglected. I ran a program that spent 100 billion pounds on the most disadvantaged communities uh, in the UK when Tony was prime minister. So I don't think we did neglect them. But um, how could you win them back? Well, the party that gave Britain the bomb, that then modernized it in Polaris, then modernized it again in Trident, can easily tell a story about patriotism uh, and loving the country. Um, a party which has um, gained masses of middle-class voters is going to be a huge problem for the Tory party. They can't win at the next election without middle-class voters. Uh, and if they start, if you start to be able to say that outer London is Labour land as well as inner London, if you start, if you actually take seriously what the Tories are doing, ripping up planning uh, legislation um, and imposing uh, development uh, in areas which have normally been protected by district councillors who are Tories, um, there's going to be a whole a whole, whole war in uh, the Tory shires going to come to us uh, over the next few years. Um, but the main thing is, it seems to me, the, as in all politics, is to, get, is to get close to people. So a party that offered credible, and that's an important word, credible plans on building houses uh, for today's young people, delivering decent pensions for today's workers uh, and providing uh, high quality social care for today's elders uh, could actually easily unite all kinds of elements uh, of the electorate who are out there who are who, who may have had promises of leveling up but they're going to be seeing in whenever the next election is three four or five years this term of Tory government will have been defined by by the pandemic and the consequential recession and trying to come out of the recession so I'm uh, I'm not a pessimist, and I think, d does the panel believe there is a policy agenda on quite core labour issues and quite personal issues like housing, pensions and social care, which could create an electoral coalition? Uh, who, who wants to come back to John on, on that? Uh, I will. Yep, yep, uh, we all can. <laughs> Deborah first, yep. Okay, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think just, just to the point, John, about, um, you know, whether or not those seats were neglected, and I think, you you know, you can talk numbers all you like, but in the end, and Tim Bell, who used to advise Margaret Thatcher, used to say perception is reality. Exactly. And it is. You know, if that is what people feel, then somehow it has to be dealt with. Whether or not they're right or wrong, that's what they feel, and it is absolutely what they feel. I never heard anything other than the sense that they had been neglected. Um, and in fact, specifically, uh, Tony Blair, you know, again, I mean, putting... Yeah, Corbyn was obviously a very unpopular leader with this group of people, indeed with many people who might have otherwise voted Labour. But it, as I said before, it, you know, it, it definitely, you know, it, it ended with him, but it didn't start with him. And a lot of people that I spoke to were rude about Tony Blair and said in three, you know, terms of government, what did he ever do for people in Accrington? Or pe Now, you, you might say loads, but they don't think he did. Um, I think that there is something else going on as well. Um, and I agree with the points to be made that those red wall seats actually, in lots of ways, are quite like lots of other places. Harlow, for instance, which is a place I just happen to have done lots of work, is, is very similar in lots of ways. There are lots and lots of constituencies that share the same features and where I think the solutions lie, you know, and it's, for instance, um, I found again and again people talking about the demise of their local high street. There was a correlation here, you know, their MS had gone very often. And this for a lot of people, women in particular, was symbolic of there being nothing decent around here. It wasn't so much about banks, actually, Caroline. I don't think I heard yeah, that. Yeah. But, but you know, we don't have a Marks and Spencer anymore. They've got no nothing nice going on around here. So there are lots of things going on. And I think I think it's it's all the same old, same old. And I think that, as you know, as Karen said, Labour needs a much bigger rethink. Actually, whoever's going to win those seats and bring about that coalition needs a much bigger rethink. And I think it is, there's a place where the cultural issues and the economic issues sort of collide 
And that is, I think, about the status of the kind of work that people do. Um, and I haven't read your book, David, uh, but I'm presuming from the cover that it touches on this, but there is a sense that people who work with their hands and people who work in caring roles, almost every woman I met in the Red Wall was working either in retail or in caring. Many were working multiple jobs, working unbelievably long hours for almost no pay. And there is a huge disparity about the way we value different sorts of work. That I think is where the cultural issues and the economic issues collide. And there's something really interesting there that could be, could be a big idea. Mm. So can I just start some, Okay. Go on. Okay. So, um, Caroline, you go yeah, first. To John, to John. I mean, look. Um, I don't think I've never thought in politics um, that we can, you know, you can, we shouldn't forget what we've done, but you can't expect for people to be grateful forever or remember everything that you've done uh, when we were in government. And it's now some ten years since we were in government, and you know, so whilst I'm sure everybody does their best to remind people of what we achieved, and we achieved a lot between '97 and 2010. Uh, for many people, it, you know, we're very close to that, but lots of people aren't. And as each year goes on, we go further away. And of course, from 2010 to 2015, we had a certain amount of trying to sort of forget what we achieved in government uh, and put that to one side. And you can't blame the voters, therefore, for not being more grateful. And I don't think we should rely, you know, rely on that or expect that. Um, I think secondly is that, of course, Jeremy Corbyn was a factor. He was a factor in 2017. Uh, at that election as well. But the big issue that was the difference between then and 2019 is that in 2017, uh, whilst people were very wary of Jeremy Corbyn, um, they did see that Labour was saying we'd respect the outcome of the referendum. Mm -hmm. By 2019, we basically, they knew more about Jeremy Corbyn and probably, you know, were even more worried in many respects. But also, they were really fed up with us over uh, the Brexit situation. And and it's interesting looking at a figure here. I mean, Labour allowed the pro-people's vote uh, people to convince them that if Labour did not pivot towards a people's vote, we would lose their support. But yet the Tories, despite their clear get Brexit done message, held but 2% of their Remain voters in the 2019 election. So we were hurtling to this ridiculous uh, situation that we found ourselves in. And, uh, and so... We have to deal with policies around housing. Of course we do, John, and some of the other things you mentioned. But we have tried that in the past, in the last few elections, and that has not been enough. We have to demonstrate that we fundamentally accept that we made mistakes to these voters, and we have to assure them that the personality and the values of our party are such that they would want to, want to vote for us again. Mm -hmm. If I could just come in, I think, on based on what um, um, Karen said there, John, you, you may feel that you know Labour did a lot of stuff economically for those areas, but I think the cultural divide is the place where people feel as if they are ignored and forgotten, and my journeys into the Red Wall would agree with everything Deborah said there. And I think when you come to the Brexit issue, that is so crucial for understanding why people felt abandoned by the Labour Party here. And the fact that you had the big figures from the new Labour era, be it Tony Blair, Peter Manderson, all those kind of people who were the, the biggest supporters of the people's vote campaign for those people who wanted Brexit done, they saw that as proof that that Labour era looked down on those people. And of course, one of the big trends of the Red War is a lot of the seats that went Tory for the first time in 2017 and 2019, the Labour vote had been decreasing over many, many years. If you take Lee on the outskirts of Manchester, when Andy Burnham won that for Labour in 1997, it had over a 20,000 majority. By 2019, it was now a 1,000 Tory majority, and that's a huge shift that you can't just attribute to certain individual factors. But I think that cultural divide is so much more potent in people's mind. And one image I remember from the 2019 campaign was in Sedgefield, which of course has that huge historical tie to Tony Blair and the New Labour project. And there was a whole bunch of people standing outside the social club where Boris went in and they came out and they were cheering Boris, Boris and it was an amazing sight to see. Three of those people were former miners who lost their jobs because of Margaret Thatcher, because of the deindustrialization under the Tories and they were out holding up signs cheering for Boris Johnson and for a lot of people trying to compute that in their heads is a very difficult thing and I think if you said to them but what about the money that was spent in the labour, what about the regional development agencies, what about all the, the national living wage 
they just wouldn't appreciate that. And I think that's the very difficult thing Keir Starmer's got to face, that they can put forward these new economic plans, but unless he can convince them culturally, mm. he's not Mr. Remainer who's against their values. It's going to be really tough for them. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think, I mean, if I can, if I can pick up on Deborah's kind um, prompting about my own book, <laughs> Head, Hand, Heart, I mean, I do think that Labour has sort of got on the wrong side of this argument. I mean, these are big social trends that are nothing to do with individual political parties, but undoubtedly in Britain and similar countries in the last couple of generations, we have allocated too much reward and prestige to just one cluster of human aptitudes, that to do with cognitive, analytical kind of exam passing ability. And we have mm -hmm. diminished other forms of, 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 of human aptitude and human ability. I mean, it's, it's, it's plain to see in the, in the income statistics, in, in, in all sorts of other things too. We've become very educationally stratified societies and we've created a very narrow definition of what it is to live a successful life. And that is, you know, pass exams, go to university and, and get a cognitive professional job. I mean, apart from the fact that not everybody either wants to or can do that, um, it's, 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 created, it's created a very narrow funnel into the world of safety and success. Um, and those people who aren't going through that funnel, um, you know, f f do feel left out and, and, and resentful about it. And there's a huge difference. You know, go back 30 years when I was at university, or even longer, 40 years, um, you know, when only kind of 10% or 15% of people in your class or town uh, went to university and you didn't, it didn't matter so much. But when nearly 50% do and, and you don't, it's a completely different psychological dynamic. And, no, you know, when Tony Blair made that famous speech in 1999 saying that 50% of school leavers should go to university, it was, a, it was a, a, a symbolic act of how distant Labour had become from, from the kind of voters we're talking about in, in the Red Wall. Um, you know, the, the, uh, Labour is, is on, has become, the, you know, one of the, has become the party perhaps of the cognitive meritocracy um, and the people that leave to achieve. And, and, you know, and John McTurn is right obviously to draw attention to what Labour did achieve in those years and the billions of pounds. But if you're not changing the underlying dynamic of what's happening in your society, you know, if still, you, on the one hand, you wring your hands about regional inequality, on the other hand, you're massively expanding residential education, regi sorry, residential higher education. So still, all those working class towns, all the Mansfields and the Rotherhams and the Doncasters, are every year losing 25 or 30 percent of their brightest 18 year olds, and they're never coming back. Well, of course, you're massively contributing to that regional, the, these grotesque regional inequalities we had. And Labour had got itself absolutely and still is on the wrong side of that argument in some ways. And, and it's easier for the Tories to represent a sort of broader coalition, I think, of, of classes and, in a sense, aptitudes too. Um, however, I would say just sort of finally on this point that, that in a way the, 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 the possible um, silver lining for Labour is that it turns out the knowledge economy doesn't actually need that many knowledge workers. I mean, so in the short term that gives us a crisis of misaligned skills and indeed misaligned expectations. I mean, it's creating a kind of angry, we're overproducing a graduate class. I think it's probably one of the factors behind Bernie Sanders in America, possibly one of the factors behind the kind of Corbyn momentum movement here. A lot of quite well educated kids who aren't getting the kinds of jobs that they expected mm. and so are getting politically angry. Um, so, I mean, but, you know, they're getting angry in a way that is alienating so many of the other potential voters that, that Labour needs to attract. But the knowledge economy, so we're actually, we're going to have more hand and heart workers in the coming decades because there simply won't be enough cognitive jobs to go around. And, and also, you know, and you can sort of see the sentiment in the country in the pandemic, you know, the applauding of the key workers, the overwhelming majority of key workers are not graduates. Um, and so, so, you know, the, the country is certainly right. But the, the question is, can Labour fill that? I mean, the, 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 the Tories are, in a sense, already filling that hole. Mm. I, mean, I mean, you know, Labour, the way that John was just talking about it, is if, you know, and indeed Caroline, well, you know, of course, social care, et cetera, et cetera. But the Tories aren't going to just sit around and have no policies of their own. They're also going to have policies on social care, which will probably be not that different to whatever Labour might propose. Can I um, quickly sorry. come in, David, just yeah. open on uh, the labour market? Uh, enough quickly. on my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick question on this. So one thing that I think is interesting, the theme I've picked up from some Labour MPs who lost their seats is 
the, the communities that were traditionally labour, um, they've lost their big industries, a lot of them, whether it's mining, manufacturing, what have you. That gave them an intrinsic bond to the trade union movement, which mm -hmm. therefore made them labour. Um, and uh, um, I'd be interested to know what Caroline thinks about this, that when you were canvassing in your seat probably 20 years ago, it was a very different makeup in terms of the jobs market then, because people worked in certain industry communities that have now become much more disparate. We know how the jobs market has changed in terms of more zero hours contrast, less stable working, which makes communities less bound together and I would say therefore less collective and less likely to vote Labour. But, but, but also you've got this, I mean, one of the reasons why the government is making such a fuss about state aid in the negotiation, the Brexit negotiations is precisely because they want to try and reverse some of these dynamics mm. and get you know, lots of you know, good professional jobs up in the areas where they've been sucked out of. Um, and... and, and to be fair, I mean, some of this is already happening. I think there's a, a huge AstraZeneca research centre um, near Middlesbrough. I mean, there, there, there are. It's not as if there's, you know, a complete desert up in the in right. the former industrial areas, but, 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 but we need more of it. Mm. Um, and 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 the Tory government seem more serious about this than, than than you know, the, than any government in the last twenty or thirty years who've talked a lot about regional inequality, but have done frig all about it. Yeah. Excuse my language. I just can I just challenge that point slightly, David, yeah. and because. I, I genuinely do think that the red wall and seats like it are not a shoe in for either party. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not hearing from the people that I spoke to that they feel that the Conservative Party gets them anymore or is on their side anymore. Uh, they felt this huge sadness to leave Labour. Um, that means actually they're quite invested in the Tories succeeding. But but what I heard was that. Boris Johnson, as he presented himself in December, as opposed to now, and we can talk about that, but I think it has changed, um, did represent something. He, he, as one woman said to me, he's desnobified the Tory party, whose own brand image remains unbelievably posh and distant from those people. Um, now, I think the jury is out about whether or not he can maintain that. I think it was a very specific set of circumstances. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, COVID it obviously offers a bit of a reset, and maybe it's a reset the Tories can take advantage of, but it might be a reset that Labour also can, can but champion. But I think, I mean, one of the weaknesses of Labour politics, you know, in the last 20 years, and I'd be interested in what you think about this, Caroline, is that Labour has worked with a very damaging caricature of the Tory party. They don't understand the Tory party any longer, particularly the new one. Mm. You know, the Tory party's intellectual um, powerhouse is, is Gove and Cummings. They represent some a completely different, I mean, they're not even really conservatives. I mean, they're pretty social democratic in economics. They're a little bit more conservative in cultural matters. They really care about things like regional inequality. Not patricianal uh, either. They're, they're, they're not, I mean, yeah, so you have on the one hand, you know, the, the easy, you know, the, 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 the part of the Tory party that Labour feels comfortable with is the kind of Etonian Boris or, or Cameron, you know, but, but actually under the, sur under the Etonian surface, leader surface, the, the actual sociology of the Tory party has changed too. I think it was, the, was it the 2010 or the 2015 election where for the first time a majority of Tory MPs are not privately educated. I mean, you may think, well, that's still, that's, that's, obviously they're still massively overrepresented uh, in, in the Tory party compared to the country, but the fact that less than half really does make a difference, you know. So when people oh, yeah. meet their, their Tory MP, particularly in red wall seats, the red wall Tory MPs are often, you know, local working class or lower middle class people. Mm. Um, and, and the uh, Tory party has changed and, and Labour, but anyway. Anyway, so I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think that look, there's always going to be that sparring in politics, you know, um, and some of the stereotypes that go on. But I think the problem is, is it's getting the balance right on this. And if you rely too much on all of that, you mm. know, sending people out on, um, you know, walking around with top hats and things like this or, or whatever, mm. I mean, it, it, you know, it makes a nice little headline and photo, but it really, you know, I think it really sort of underestimates how the public are much more engaged in thinking about what they want for themselves and families. And, and some of this is, you know, just doesn't really appeal. And, and I, you're absolutely right. Um, the tour, when I came in in 1997, uh, the Tory benches were much more typical of the sort of stereotypes mm -hmm. that we think about. And, and I could see that changing over the years, not just in terms of class and where people came from, but in diversity, in terms of ethnicity yeah. as well. Yeah. And of course, yeah. women too. Yeah. And, um, and somehow along the way, 
Um, I think Labour really didn't have a, a more you know, in-depth discussion internally about what was going on and therefore how we should just re think about how we apply what we say. Uh, let me give you an example of something. I, in good faith the other day, retweeted the thing with Angela Rayner uh, where she talked when she was at the dispatch box um, uh, last week and she was saying, you know, you know, a working class woman with an accent here, you know, this is, you know, an amazing thing to do and, and so on. And I, you know, and to be honest, she's got an amazing story of what she's overcome in her life, which I feel those stories are really important, to be mm. honest. Uh, and they don't get enough attention in politics and the media where, you know, let's be honest, it's pretty much dominated very much by middle class southerners at the end of the day. But on, on the reaction on Twitter from some people, because obviously the tail end of her thing was to ha have a pop at Econius, was someone sent me a message saying, um, the people who held me back in life weren't Etonians, but the teacher at school who told me I would never account for anything. Mm. And actually, whilst there are loads of teachers who are inspirational in encouraging people uh, to have aspiration and get on in life, the fact is lots of people have stories about where they felt they were held back by, you know, what was going on in their community, what was going on with a teacher saying, you're not good enough. I can remember um, as, a, as, a, as a new MP going to a school that just received computers as part of a Labour initiative and the head teacher saying to me, I don't know why we've got these here. Most of these kids will never have to use a computer. And I said, that is not the case. So aspiration and the Labour Party being able to speak to aspiration <coughs> has to be more than just taking pot shots mm. at Tories in this sort of stereotypical yeah. uh, man mm. uh, manner. It's much, much more than that. Yeah. People in communities yeah. want to see the establishment in whatever form it is being challenged on how they provide services and how they talk to people. And I think that is really important. And Sebastian's point about my seat and what it was like, you know, 20 years ago, we had one working pit still working in Don Valley and there were a, a few others around uh, the area in South Yorkshire. Uh, so it had already happened. The jobs had gone really pretty much from coal mining. Um, and, um, and actually over the last 20 years, um, I think we've actually improved in lots of ways, some of the job opportunities that are available, but we are still pretty much overall a low wage, low skill economy. And so when parties, and this goes to the Brexit thing as well, talk about the benefits of being in the European Union, mm. you know, the benefits of the city strategy, um, the benefits of migration, I have no doubt that, you know, the net benefits of all of that uh, to our country are a, a case that you can make. Mm. But actually, the sharing of those benefits is not the same across the whole country. And certainly in terms of something like migration, if we're talking about valuing the work of people in caring professions or with their hands, then we have to uh, we have to deal with the fact that those working areas have become less secure, fewer employment rights, zero hour contracts. And quite honestly, as a, someone who once said to me on the doorstep, actually this is in the 2017 election, he worked in the care se sector and he said, I've done all the training that they've asked me to do. But the differentials between my pay and someone coming in at the first stage is about 20p mm. per hour. Um, so if we don't attend to those issues and that work, that we'll still need, we're still going to need care workers. Yeah. Robots aren't going to replace them. The knowledge economy is not going to replace that. No, we exactly. have to invest in that area. Instead of, as many people in communities like Doncaster and elsewhere felt, the easy supply of labour from the European Union was just adding to the problems mm. of uh, destabilising wages and uh, creating greater insecurity. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, I, I'm going to take those as your final remarks because okay. we have got to wrap up. I'm going to give the other two uh, a brief chance as well. We, we, we've run over time a little bit, but uh, um, why don't you go, Sebastian, and then um, Deborah, who started us off, can finish us off. Thanks, David. Well, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. And I think the one thing that we've kind of all highlighted here is that 
last year was a moment for the Red Wall. It was very clear that this was the culmination of something. Uh, but it does seem to me there is a way back for Labour, I think, based on what Deborah said and what Caroline said, if, if, that if the Labour Party was truly serious about taking these places back, the policies, the cultural attitude, the message, that is obvious. So I think this idea, you know, to go back to the whole point of the session, can the Red Wall re be rebuilt for Labour? I think, yes, it can. But it feels to me as if it's going to be longer than a five year project that I think Keir Starmer might take back some of those seats in 2024. Mm. But if Labour does want to try and create a new message, a new coalition, it's probably going to take another five years and another leader. And of course, by that point, it means you've had another five years of this particular Tory government, which, as you said, is very different to past Tory governments and will do things to make it even harder for Labour to win back. So I think, as I said at the beginning, I think Keir Starmer is doing all the right things, but he needs to go much further and think about that broader message and not half backwards because I think the fundamental thing that I think the Red Wall wants is people don't want to talk about how great things were in the past. They want to be respected now. They want to feel their lives are getting better now and they can go down their street and see that new shops are opening, see that there are banks there. And none of these things are easy for the government to do. You know, you can throw lots of state cash at trying to make high streets better. That doesn't necessarily make them better or more sustainable. But trying to answer these difficult questions are what both parties need to do. And ironically, because the Tories are moving to the left on economics, it could be that Labour and the Conservatives end up with similar policy mm. prescriptions for the kind of things they want to do here. Mm. But I think fundamentally, for the people who live in the Red War and have seen this sense of not being listened to, this is a good thing. The fact for the first time in 20, 30 years mm. that both political parties are focusing all their energies right. on making yeah. it feel better yeah. for the fact we've got a country that's incredibly divided, has a huge amount of mistrust in politicians in Westminster, yeah. this is a really good thing and a really positive thing. So I think it's an incredibly exciting time ahead for the Red Wall and it'll be fascinating to come back in a decade and see are these places fundamentally a lot better because they certainly should be. Yeah, yeah. And all the books that are being written about it. You know, I mean, you know, virtually everybody who lives in the Red Wall is going to be interviewed by someone writing a book. It seems. That's um, true. Um, they should charge them. I must yeah. say they're enjoying <laughs> this. Yeah, final, final word from Deborah. Yeah, actually, one thing I did want to say when we were talking about Labour and Tory and stereotypes, I think in a way the most damaging stereotype is Labour's own view of itself. And it was James Kanakasorium who pointed this out to me. I interviewed him for my book. He's the man who, who uh, Tory strategist, who kind of came up with the notion of the Red Wall in the first place. And he said, the problem with Labour is that they, they think they have a moral right to do 50% of the vote. And that means they don't think strategically. Um, you know, they think that they're the good guys and it's just coming their way. And I, I think that that has to end. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I, I don't think this is a shoe in for either party. I think both face really significant challenges. But what I would say from all the people I interviewed and, you know, listened to in focus groups and so on, there is a feeling of real excitement. So this is a group of people and this is a positive feeling, not a negative feeling. Yeah. They flex their muscles. They understand their power. Yeah. And actually, yeah. it might be a bit of a triumph of hope over experience, but they do think this is their time. Yeah. And they're setting the bar quite high. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's there for the taking. And I think it's more fluid and volatile than any of us could guess. Yeah. As I'm always saying to my liberal Hampstead friends, I mean, this is democracy working. And actually, you know, yeah. the huge attention that both parties are now committing to parts of the population that have been neglected economically and politically over the last yeah. um, generation or two shows actually the strength of democracy. Yes. Yeah. Democracy and culturally, working. I mean, they, you know, their views have been sidelined in every sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they be, it's about being first and foremost is do you value these people? Mm. Yeah. Do you value their concerns? Are you listening or are you paying lip service? Yeah. And you know, I, you know, I think you know, Labour can start the journey back, but it has to avoid thinking that just throwing in a few token examples of patriotism or you know, saying we're listening. Yeah. You know, yeah. listening it only really had delivers results when people can see things you're saying in action. And the decisions Labour makes um, when Boris starts setting some traps over the next few years are going to be vital in all this about how they're perceived. Right. Anyway, we, we really must wrap it up now. But thank, thanks to uh, you three here and uh, thanks to, um, to whoever is out there. Thank you for, for, for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.